gets a little warm in here, um, we are going to try to get that adjusted. What is that? Okay. All right. We're going to try to get that adjusted. Um, so if you will bear with us. Right. So um, we are here, of course, on um, Clay to Brewer at all versus Metro. Um, and we will get started here momentarily when Ms. Taylor comes back. She will officially call the case. Um, and then I will delineate the order um, that we will go forward in. Um, I, it's a practice of mine to always give everyone time for rebuttal at the end. Um, but since this is petitioner's motion, they will have the last word. But I will let you all um, engage in a, a back and forth if you need to. Okay, well, I've been told that that sound is our cooling system not working, so I do um, apologize for that. Case number 23-0538, part three, Plato Brewer versus Metro et al. All right, petitioners, you have the floor. Petitioners, you have the floor. So we will go with the petitioners. I'll hear from Metro. Um, I'll hear from the interveners, and then I'll pivot back to the petitioners. Okay, does that work for everyone? Yes, sir. All right. Hey, please, the court. My name is Doug Beers, and I represent the plaintiff of the name Brewer. You're going to have to speak up a lot, um, <laughs> considering that um, very loud noise. All right. Uh, the Tennessee Public Records Act requires that all public records be made available to the public unless there is some exemption to the contrary. In this case, it is completely undisputed that the records at issue are public records, and therefore the only question before the court is whether there is any valid exemption. And in making that determination, there is a presumption of openness. Uh, specifically, uh, that is reflected in the statute, which is in the case that uh, their person opposing openness must show cause. Mr. Pierce, I am so sorry. If you would just bear with me one moment. All right, we're gonna take a bit of a pause because I cannot get anything to open. Um, so, just a moment, I do apologize. Mm -hmm. I'm going to restart and see if that helps.
You can be seated. It, it may be a minute. The computer is spinning. So. And you all can kind of be at ease. All right, we're going to do a do-over. Okay. 
So petitioners will have the floor. Would you like to call the case again, uh, Ms. Saylor? Thank you. The court calls case number 23-0538, part three, Plato Brewer versus Metro et al. May it please the court, my name is Doug Pierce and I represent Clayton Renee Brewer. Uh, this is a case brought under the Tennessee Public Records Act. And under that act, all public records are available to the public unless there is an exemption to the contrary. And therefore, because it is completely undisputed that the records at issue are public records, the only issue before the court is whether there are any exemptions that would preclude of public access to these public records. And in making that determination, the Public Records Act uh, clearly establishes that there is a presumption of openness. This presumption of openness is shown by the fact that we have uh, provided for in the statute a show cause hearing in which the party opposing access must show cause why the records should not be made available to the public. And in trying to make that showing, those parties have the burden of proof. So Metro uh, or, and whoever stands in their shoes, such as the interveners, they have the burden of proof here. And then finally, uh, the statute expressly states that the statute shall be construed to allow the broadest possible public access to records. So it is a presumption of openness that is a strong presumption of openness. Your Honor, uh, can you hear me? We're working on it. I'm happy to pause during the uh, AC issue, but I think there'd be a lot of pauses. I know, and I, I didn't know that there was an AC issue um, until right this moment. So um, now we're going to try to turn your microphone up, and maybe if you can adjust it towards your mouth a little bit more so that you're just louder. Let me have to adjust my mouth to the mic. Okay. I, mean, okay. I think that I think I can tell that may be better. Yeah. Thank you. You know, this presumption of openness is not unique to the Public Records Act. We live in an open democratic society of government by the people, for the people, and this concept of openness of government records and information pervades all government information. Uh, that includes court records and court proceedings. Uh, I've cited some cases to that effect. And even this court's own website, uh, when it talks about how to file something under seal, points out that there is a presumption of openness. That is simply a function of the society in which we live. In other words, the strong general rule is that government information is available to the public unless there is a specific reason to the contrary. But that is not absolute, isn't that correct? That is exactly correct, Your Honor. That's why we have the exceptions. In fact, we have in the Public Records Act, we have over 730 exceptions. So there are a lot of exceptions, no question about that. But first, the general rule is, is the general rule that we start with. And I, I want to point out that, uh, you know, one thing the Public Records Act does not say it does not say that the party requesting records has got to explain why or state why they want the records. That is not a requirement. Uh, we certainly have very good reasons, and I can go into those, but that's a function of the presumption of openness and the fact that we live in this open democratic society. And once again, that is not a function of simply the Open Records Act. Uh, our state law is very much different than the federal FOIA law, but that same concept exists in the federal law. Every state in this country has an open records law. Uh, they're all slightly different schemes. I've worked with a great many of them. I'm not aware of any open records law that would require someone to state why they want the records. Now, to Metro's credit, they handle enough of these cases. They know better than to suggest that that is in any way an issue. However, the interveners in their, some of their opening briefs, they said that we had failed to establish a compelling reason for why we wanted this information. Number one, we don't have to uh, assert any reason, much less a compelling reason, but we, we can clearly establish that we do have compelling reasons. 
the undisputed proof in this case shows that this sort of information uh, historically, has, and even in this case with the proof, can save lives because these writings can be studied and as a result of that we, we have a track record of similar incidences specifically in schools of school violence being averted because these writings have been studied in other cases. But isn't it also the, the opposite of that argument is that releasing certain writings may compel others to copycat or engage in similar behavior. That's the other argument that is being made before the court. That is the argument that's being made, and that argument is not very well supported. To, the, to a certain degree, our own expert uh, supports that very argument, Your Honor, but points out it is for a limited time only, a very short duration. That's just the way it is, and we are well past that point. Of, uh, and in fact, in every case, by the time the police do their investigation, we're gonna, it, it's roughly a two-week period. That is what empirical research shows. Um, so, to the extent that there is an argument uh, suggesting that, that argument is not supported. What is supported is only it is a short-term contagion effect. When someone, when you have one school shooting, is there going to be another mass shooting? And, and that, that is simply the fact that there is the shooting, not necessarily that there is a writing about the shooting. What our expert has pointed out is that you don't get a renewal of this two-week period every time there is a, another news story about this case. I think Your Honor can take judicial notice. Number one, there is a lot of public interest in this community about this case, and in fact, even across the country. And there, I think the court can take judicial notice that there have been news reports in this community over and over about this case. And the very fact that there are news reports, it, it brings the attention, the issue up to people's attention, and that, that is separate and apart from whether the writings are released. So your point is well taken, Your Honor, but it is for a very short duration. And, and just to finish up this point, uh, we have very good reasons for why we need this, but once again, the burden of proof is on the other side. Uh, and, and and for anyone to even suggest that we have a compelling reason to get the documents, that reflects two things. One, the person suggesting that, they generally do not understand the concept of open government generally, and in particular, they don't understand the concept of the Tennessee Public Records Act. And specifically, number two, uh, they have not satisfied their burden of proof. Moving on to the particular records at issue, Ms. Brewer made a request for eight specific categories of documents. However, all of them, uh, the first one was for the, the writings of the shooter. And thereafter, the remaining seven were all derivatives of those writings, all referred to the writings. And in response to that, uh, Metro filed the uh, declaration of, the first declaration of uh, Lieutenant uh, Gibson. And it, he had in his uh, declaration a matrix of the various uh, requests, and as for our uh, request, our eight requests, uh, only f four of them were not, uh, let me rephrase that, Metro stated that they didn't have documents for four of the eight, they only had documents for the other four of the eight. Now I do want to point out that I, I have confronted Metro both informally and also in filings with the court that they conflated two of our uh, requests. That was request two and three. And I, I, maybe that was just inadvertent on their part, but I, I don't know whether they were saying they didn't have uh, documents for our request two and three, or whether they, they, they simply didn't address that one and that one was left open. But ultimately what we're talking about here are the writings of the shoe. Uh, and the issue then is, well, what exceptions apply? And um, Metro asserted five exceptions. Um, those five exceptions, the leadoff one is Rule 16, and I'll come back to that. But the other four exceptions, uh, three of them, they deal with very specific information. 
contact information such as social security information. You know, we didn't request that. We don't want it to the extent that it might exist in the writings that the shooter has or the other records we requested. Obviously, that needs to be redacted. The public records law is very big on redaction, and I can go into how this, our Supreme Court has addressed that. But if there's any of the information that they have uh, indicated would be covered by some of these uh, other uh, exemptions, uh, and it's there, such as social security numbers, or someone's home address, or email address, that, that it needs to be redacted. And so we have common ground on that point. That's not a dispute. Now that does bring up the issue of one of the other uh, exemptions that they raised, and that's the school security exemption found at 10-7-504 subsection P. Uh, once again, we did not request any school security information, and so we don't have a problem with that unless they're trying to assert that so broadly that it's going to cut into some of the writings of the shooter. And in regard to that, I, I want to point out that the interveners in Metro, in their filings, they both mentioned the, uh, and they quoted the revised section that I just mentioned. That revised section came in after we had made our request, the request was denied, and this lawsuit was filed. All of these lawsuits were filed. And we pointed out that, I mean, there is no retroactive effect of this revised subsection P for school security, and Metro has acknowledged that there is no revised, uh, no retroactive application of that section. So even though your client has not in particularly requested school information, you know, you can leave that to the others who have requested that, or are you willing to tell the court whether or not pursuant to the statute at the time that was in effect, private schools have a carve out because they're not public schools, or how does that exception work when we're talking about a private versus public school setting? Your Honor, I think that is best left to my co-petitioners. Okay. I, I will say this, I have talked to them generally, and I think I can represent for them that one clear dividing line that we want to offer to the court is that we are not asking for anything that the school created. If the school has some security plan, uh, we didn't ask for it and we don't want it. What we wanted, uh, and that's certainly true for me, if my co-petitioners need to modify what I've said, um, I I'm sure that they will, but that's where I'm at on this. So anything that is property of the school that may have been caught up in the investigation as everyone was doing their due diligence. You're saying you don't want that information, is that correct? My client does not Your want client it. Does My not. client does not want it. Okay. And I think the other co petitioners don't want it, but I, I better let them speak for themselves. Okay, understandable. Um, and uh, I probably hammered on that enough, but you know, even if that uh, revised statute was in place, it dealt with threats. Uh, that was the uh, point of it. Uh, and in this case, the shooter made no threats because regardless of what she wrote, she never communicated it to any third party. So I, I think we've covered that. that. That brings us to you know the, the real heart of the matter, which is Rule 16 as it relates to Metro. Your Honor, Rule 16 as an exception to the Public Records Act uh, has been developed in four cases from the Tennessee Supreme Court. We had Holt, Apman, Schneider, and the Tennessean, or the Vanderbilt rape case. And all of those are instructive as to what needs to be done in this case. Well, what about Griffin? Griffin versus, give me one second, the city of Knoxville. Chuck Griffin versus the city of Knoxville. So that case is a part of this jurisprudence. Um, the petitioners have not cited to that case, but well, when I, go uh, ahead. Uh, I'm, no, I'm interrupted your honor. I don't mean to do that. I was just going to say, when I look at the facts of that case, that case is more analogous to the case that we have at Barr versus the other, Apperman, Memphis Publishing, all of the other ones that you've cited in the court's opinion. But you all have not, the petitioners have not brought up that case at all. So if you've read the case, I would love to hear kind of your take on the case and how that case should be instructive 
to the court? Because that's a Supreme Court case as well. Um, I may get it, have that case confused with another case. Are you talking about the, the suicide note case? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, well, and that's, court, that's Chuck Griffin versus City of Knoxville. Okay. Uh, well, number one, I want to point out that uh, the positioners prevailed in that case, as I understand it. That, that there was no uh, exception of Rule 16 applied that denied ac uh, access. But the court did, the Supreme Court, set forth what the test is, the totality of the circumstances test, right? And so when this court looks at whether or not the record should be released, at least the Supreme Court has said in a case that is very similar to this case that it's the totality of the circumstances that the court should look at. We'll get back to Rule 16, but while the petitioners did prevail, I think that there were some facts upon which the petitioners prevailed in that case that are not in this case. Would you agree with me? As I understand and recall that case, I do agree with Your Honor, and I have no problem with what the court said there, although, you know, Griffin came in between, you know, it was quite some time ago, but it came after Appman. I'm pretty sure, that, I think that was the sequence of events. So Griffin was in 1991, but it's still good law. Oh, oh absolutely, and Appman is good law as well. And Appman set the standard, and none of the cases, you know, the most recent case, as I pointed out, uh, from the Supreme Court is the Tennessean case, and none of them have revoked uh, Appman. It, it set forth a simple test, and I have no problem with applying all of the circumstances, and I'm very happy to address the circumstances in this case. But uh, just very briefly, you know, in the Holt case, uh, you know, that was a similar case to this case in which we had a shootout with the police and the, uh, had an incident where the, the shooter was killed, and the Memphis Police Department said, well, case closed, that's the end of it. And then they, the police were shocked to find out they had to turn over the records. They didn't like that one little bit, but the Supreme Court said, yeah, you got to do that. And um, as I pointed out in my brief, there were, um, there was a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth by the law enforcement community about that matter. But all less than two years later, we had the, the Appman decision. And, and what we had in the Appman decision is, uh, uh, setting forth the Rule 16. And, and what the court said is that, as an exception to the Public Records Act, Rule 16 only, quote, uh, applies where the files are open and are relevant to pending or contemplated criminal action, end quote. So would you agree that this case then is distinguishable? Now we'll hear from Metro. They have not had the opportunity to address the court. But when we look at Atman, when we look at Schneider, when we look at Memphis, well, Memphis is a little bit different, but all of those investigations were closed. And isn't this case different? Your Honor, the point is, from what I just read, is from Atman setting forth the test, which has never been modified, there are three requirements for application of Rule 16. Number one, first and foremost, there must be an pending or contemplated criminal action. Keep in mind, what I just read then said and. So that's number one, and it stands alone. If there is no pending or contemplated criminal action, Rule 16 is out the door. And that's very understandable, because if you don't have the criminal action, this is a rule of criminal procedure. So the rule of criminal procedure doesn't apply unless you've got the criminal action. And there's no question in this case, we don't have anything pending. The question is, do we have anything contemplated? And I'll explain in a moment that the Metro's own declarations show they do not have anything that is contemplated. But like I say, there's three requirements that I've just set out that come from Atman. First, you have to have the pending or contemplated criminal action. Then you have an open file. And the third point, which is most important as it relates to redaction, is that whatever's in that file must be relevant to the, uh, uh, the criminal action. And so when we look at the rule in Atman, it is pending or contemplated, but it does not apply where the files are open and relevant or contemplated. 
So it's a dissection of whether or not it's and or or. And even if we go back to the rule itself, rule 16, there is a strong or in there that the petitioners, frankly, have not addressed. Everything has been about whether or not there is a criminal proceeding. But what about investigations? The rule contemplates, Rule 16, and whether or not things are exempted from disclosure during a pending investigation or criminal proceeding. Uh, Would you agree with me? Uh, no, Your Honor. The word is not or. The word is and. In Rule 16? In the test. That's, Your Honor, you don't apply a rule of criminal procedure if you don't have a criminal case, either pending or contemplated. I mean, you don't apply it to a civil case. You don't apply it to a, uh, an employment investigation of some sort. It only applies to criminal proceedings. Uh, and Appen makes clear that could be pending or contemplated, but you got to have a criminal proceeding. That's what a criminal rule of procedure is for. So help me understand this. Let's let's not talk about this case. Let's let's use a hypothetical case. Let's say um, someone steal something from Joe Citizen and there hasn't been a defendant identified but there is an investigation on who stole something. So are you suggesting because there's not a criminal proceeding that any investigative file that the police are building would be open to a public records request? No, Your Honor, and I'm happy to get into that a little more detail when you talk about the Schneider case because they had somewhat similar to what you just talked about or at least addressed that possibility. But at, at that moment, you know, if I'm the guy that had something stolen from me, the moment I report it to the police, they've taken over that case and, and they are considering that case for, because they know that a crime has been committed, assuming that I've told them the and we'll assume that uh, I told them the truth, yeah, I got robbed. Uh, they know that a crime has been committed. What they don't know is who committed that crime, but they know a crime has been committed. In this case, Your Honor, this case right here we're here for today, we don't know that a crime's been committed. We know that that shooting occurred, but that person is dead, and there is going to be no prosecution of that person. And all Metro has said is, well, maybe somebody else is involved. It's a possibility, but that does not satisfy the burden of proof. I mean, they have no reason whatsoever to believe that there is anyone in the world that has committed any act that would constitute a crime beyond the person who is now dead in this incident. But can you or I really sit in that position and make that determination because we are investigating? And so if you can, if, if the court controls the rule as you are suggesting that the court should, doesn't that put a heavy burden on the judiciary to step in, really step into the shoes of police and determine whether or not they are finished or have identified all of the people that be that could be connected to a crime that has been committed. I think we all can agree that a crime was committed, you know, but I don't know that you or I can say definitively that everyone has been accounted for because I know I'm not doing the investigating. Would you agree that you're not doing the investigating? Um. To answer your question, Your Honor, and I, I hope you don't take offense to that, but I, I would say that, no, I don't have to do it, but Your Honor does have to do it. That's, that's your role here. So you're saying that I'm supposed to do the investigating into whether or not a, a crime has been committed? Not an investigation. Okay. Your Honor has to look at the evidence that the party with the burden of proof puts forward to determine, has there been a crime? Is, is there a crime? Is there a criminal? Uh, the point is, as I pointed out in both the Holt and the Schneider cases, you know, the police came in and said, hey, uh, we don't want to turn over our records. And the court said, yeah, you got to turn them over. And, and I've made it very clear, you know, the, 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 and the police have tried very hard. When I say the law enforcement community, they've tried to get uh, some exemptions. I mean, Your Honor, there's got to be a standard. 
Otherwise, if this court were to say, you know, I, I'm not going to look into it, at that point, every law enforcement organization in this state says the same thing as well. We have no reason whatsoever to believe that there's anyone else in the world that's committed anything for which there can be a criminal prosecution, but we want to look into it some more. And therefore, that just doesn't satisfy what the Supreme Court uh, said in all of its uh, Rule 16 decisions. I think the judiciary does have an obligation to address, uh, do we really have something here? And, and, and in that regard, uh, let me move on to a, a point that I've made here. Um, you know, Metro has said that I have suggested that uh, they need to establish a probable cause to, uh, to support that determination, and therefore, you, you're, basically, Your Honor would have to determine probable cause, which, of course, courts do all the time. Your Honor, I, you know, I encourage you to go back through all of my briefs and, and look for where I made that probable cause argument, but I'll tell you up front, you'll be searching in vain because I never made a probable cause argument. What I said was the lowest possible standard that exists in the law. It already exists in the law, and that is reasonable suspicion. That is a standard that the police have to have before they take action against a person as little as stopping them for questions. And in this case, they've established they do not even have reasonable suspicion. And I just point out that, you know, when Metro sets up this straw man argument to say probable cause, when I never uh, uh, addressed it, and they completely ignore the reasonable suspicion argument, I, I think they've conceded that they need to be subject to judicial oversight. And that judicial oversight, I'm just suggesting, needs to be the lowest possible uh, standard, and that standard would be uh, reasonable suspicion. Um, I want to address the Snyder case with you because you you brought Snyder up and you said that law enforcement in that case with the interview cards, you know, they just didn't want to release the interview cards. But in that case, would you agree with me that Snyder, the the city of Jackson, did not use a Rule 16 exception? They were using a common law, you know, police <clears throat> exception. And, and that is not something that the court found to be accurate. But in this case, I don't believe that Metro has asserted kind of this criminal investigative exception. They are relying on Rule 16. And so those are distinguishable. So in Snyder, it went back to the trial court to determine whether or not Rule 16 applied. And I don't have what the trial court ultimately decided, but the exception that the Snyder case that they were relying on is not something that we are dealing with in this case. Would you agree with me? Yana, the answer to your question is yes and no. The answer to the question is they are far too intelligent to raise the same issue that got clearly rejected by Schneider. So they're not doing that, and yet that is exactly what they are doing, calling it a Rule 16 investigation. Once again, as I said, I mean, if this court were to say the minimal uh, uh, evidence that they've offered, if that constitutes uh, Rule 16, uh, then essentially they have what was rejected in Schneider and Holt as well. Uh, what I am arguing is that, yes, there needs to be a judicial standard and judicial oversight when they've offered no more evidence than what they've offered in this case. And one of your clients is a police organization, is that correct? I'm sorry, you're not saying? One of your clients that you represent with Ms. Brewer, it's a, it's a police organization, is that right? Yes, she's working with the National Police Association, yes. And so it's, it's I, I just want to make sure that Ms. Brewer, as representing the police, is taking the the opinion that the court should come in and determine when investigations are opened and closed. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor, and that's also supported with the uh, declaration of Mr. Ed Hutchison, who works with the uh, National Police Association. And I, I put it in a footnote, but I, I do want to clarify. Uh, you know, somebody listening to me right now might think I'm very hostile to law enforcement and police, and I most certainly am not. Uh, people that I'm working with uh, want standards. 
standards that can be helpful to the police. And without going it into it, I, um, I, I, I don't think the cop on the beat here is, a, is in favor of what's happening at, at the Metro level, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but my, the National Police Association, as a general rule, they, they represent the law enforcement officer, not the law enforcement agencies. And so I, I, I hope that I've addressed that concern with the court. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand your argument. Um, and I've made some statements I need to sort of back up a little bit here, and that is, I mean, wh what has Metro offered here? Back in May of last year, they offered the declaration of Assistant Chief Mike Hagar, and what Mr. Hagar, or Chief Hagar, had to say in paragraph 12 of his declaration is, quote, I do not believe that releasing the redacted version of the writings will impede the investigation. Therefore, the MNPD does not object to the release of the redacted records if, after having heard from all the interested parties and the covenant parents, if this court should so direct, end quote. What Chief Hagar is saying is that Rule 16 doesn't apply. They're simply deferring to the interveners here. And so that, he's got no problem with releasing it, and it's not going to interfere with the, as long as it's redacted. And we've got no problem with redaction. So they simply said they're washing their hands of it, but in so doing, they have said that they don't have a Rule 16 issue. And at the same time that that declaration was submitted, we had the declaration of Lieutenant Brent Gibson back in May of last year. And what Lieutenant Gibson had to say is that in paragraph 20, quote, while we believe at this time that the assailant acted alone in this case, we do not know for sure, and we need to investigate the matter thoroughly. When they say they don't know for sure, all he's saying is, well, it's possible there's someone else. And he goes on to say, well, it's possible that there was another crime committed. In other words, a crime of obtaining a firearm for someone. That's the mere possibility of a possibility of somehow assisting the shooter. These would be separate crimes, but they don't have a crime and they don't have a criminal. And, and that just doesn't reach any kind of standard. But, then at, but at the time, don't they also say in the same affidavits that they're still investigating? So, you know, the, the court really um, needs some guidance from you on how this court can determine whether or not Metro was finished with its investigation. When I have affidavits that say, we are investigating, we're gathering, I have recent affidavits saying that it's not closed, we think we'll be finished around July, you know, so I have these statements from the agency that is doing the investigation saying that they are still investigating. So are you saying that the court should just say, well, the investigation is closed, or what should the court do? The investigation does not mean anything so long as there is no pending or contemplated criminal action. That is what Atman says, and that line has continued on through uh, the other cases from our Supreme Court. Uh, it's got to be a pending or contemplated criminal action, and based upon what I've just read from Chief Hagar and Lieutenant Gibson, uh, we do not have a contemplated criminal action that does not rise to the level. It is a mere possibility, and the possibility does not satisfy the standard of proof. And so th that may be, a, I mean, th that is clearly a point of law, Your Honor. Uh, I mean, you, you had suggested maybe it was or, investigation or a criminal case. But th that's, not, that's not what the Supreme Court's opinions say. <clears throat> you have to have them both. Um, I'm anticipating a metro argument here, but uh, well, I, I think I better, I better just I'll wait till they make it before I anticipate it. Okay. Um, continuing on with the Schneider case, and specifically the concept of 
Uh, oh, 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 and to finish up on that investigation, as you may know, uh, uh, Metro submitted five different declarations of uh, Lieutenant Gibson, the last, the fifth declaration. He gave a long, detailed uh, protocol for investigations. Of course, that protocol is not found in any of our Supreme Court cases. They can have as much protocol as they want, but once again, if they don't have the pending or contemplated criminal action, that just doesn't matter. But moving on to the concept of redaction, uh, in the Schneider case, what the court said is that, and just by background, and I think Your Honor knows this, you know, so the city of Jackson, their police department, they, they had they had 369 of these field interview cards, which the Jackson son had requested, and uh, the Supreme Court said, yeah, you got to turn them over unless they might relate to a, an investigation that you have of a pending or contemplated criminal action. But the court went on to say that, uh, quote, the trial court shall determine which of the field interview cards or portions of them are exempt from disclosure. An entire field interview card should not be deemed exempt simply because it contains some exempt information. Rather, redaction of the exempt information is appropriate, end quote. Now, as I pointed out in one of my briefs, I mean, you know, a city the size of Jackson, Tennessee, you know they had sort of some of the hypotheticals that you had. That they had crimes committed, which they didn't know who the perpetrator was. But the Supreme Court didn't say, well, since you don't know who the perpetrator is, you get to consider all 369 of these uh, field interview cards a a as exempt because it's conceivable that maybe somehow possibly that somebody that you had the interview card with was one of the uh, perpetrators. You know, that's not enough. Uh, once again, that's too speculative and it does not satisfy the burden of proof. And, and that's what we can take from the Schneider decision. But furthermore, the court's making it very clear that even if, and this is what I want, I want to make clear, Your Honor, e even if the court were to rule, yes, Rule 16 does apply, it is almost impossible to believe that everything that they've gathered, uh, which they've indicated is a lot of material, would not be at least somewhat uh, uh, available to the public with redactions. That's certainly consistent with what Chief Hagar said. Um, and, and so they just don't get to say, oh, Rule 16 applies. And once again, if Your Honor were to say that, uh, they would have that. But that doesn't mean everything is exempt. They've got to go through and redact. That's what Schneider said. Well, and I don't know that Metro's position is that everything, you know, is exempt. I, I think that, at least when I read their papers, they are still investigating, and they believe that that investigation is going to come to a close in a few months, and then at that time, they have a closed investigation, which would be supportive of Atman, you know, basically all of the Supreme Court cases dealing with Rule 16, which had a closed investigation, except for Griffin, which had, you know, Griffin was just a little bit different, which the court finds to be instructive for this analysis. But I think, you know, the court really struggles when, and I pulled up the Atman case just to make sure that I could put my eyes on what you were telling me. And when I, when I look at Atman, the court quotes Rule 16 and, you know, says the exception to disclosure and inspection does not apply to investigative files in possession of state agents or law enforcement officers where the files have been closed and are not relevant to any pending or contemplated criminal action, but does apply where files are open and are relevant to a pending or contemplated criminal action. And they quote, they, they cite to Memphis Publishing versus Holt. So when the court looks at the Atman case, which you are relying on heavily, and it looks at the plain language of the rule, 
that open investigation is is salient throughout and you know I, I'm just wanting to understand from your client's perspective and from your perspective how this court if I have affidavits that say it's open we're investigating it's going to be closed on this date or around about this date how this court comes in and says well I've looked at everything and I say it's closed because I'm not boots on the ground I mean I've got the records here but I'm not boots on the ground I don't know what they're doing to be frank you know I know what they have told me but how does that I need you to at least give me your best how does the court really make that determination? You know, it's a preponderance of the evidence standard, right? So I'm looking at 50, you know, like 51 preponderance of the evidence. It's not, you know, as we are over in criminal world. So they've set forth affidavits that say that it's open. Now, I've got questions for Metro because they have some conflicting statements that they're going to have to deal with that definitely play into the analysis. But sitting here today they're saying the investigation is still open and when I look at what the Supreme Court has said and rule 16 how do I come in and say it's closed um, well you know I, I, I think I've explained how the way I read uh, the Supreme Court's directive is that first you have to have a pending or contemplated criminal action. And that's the whole point of a rule of criminal procedure. You don't apply a rule of criminal procedure if you don't have a pending or criminal, uh, contemplated criminal action. So tell me how you define contemplated. It's got to be, be more than a mere possibility. And, and I'll address this point. Uh, I, I pointed out that you know, they're not so much as identified, or, or rather not so much as said, they have a person of interest. And in response, Metro says, well, that would tip our hand and it uh, would let the person of interest know. And then they don't say this, but obviously they flee the jurisdiction. Your Honor, that's not what we asked for. That's another straw man argument. I didn't ask for the identity of anyone. I asked, do you have anyone? Don't tell me their name, address, anything about them. Just do you have someone? And, and they've made it very clear. They don't have anyone. So not only do they not have a crime, they don't have a criminal. And when you don't have that, you don't have a contemplated criminal proceeding. You just have a possibility, which is speculation, which does not satisfy the burden of proof. Okay. Thank you. Um, and what I was, um, and so I certainly wanted to answer your question, but I, I was trying to move on to the uh, redaction issue. And I wanted to make sure these two didn't get uh, uh, mixed up with one another. My point is, is even if you know the court were to disagree with me on Rule 16 and say, yeah, Rule 16 still applies here, they've got to provide documents that can take out the exempt, uh, take out the confidential information. That's what Snyder makes painfully clear. And once again, for all of the records that they say that they have, to say that well, none of the records, none of this information can be produced. Uh, that is almost impossible to believe. And, and we know that from looking at a couple of documents. One, as you know, we had these three leaked pages. Uh, you know, so I, I did struggle, Mr. Pierce, in all honesty, you know, I struggled with this part of your brief because whomever chose to leak the documents did not, mm, they had a disrespect for the rule of law. And so, the court struggles with hearing from lawyers who I know respect the rule of law tell me that I should look to what someone did who does not respect the rule of law, does not respect this court, does not respect police investigation and say, you know what, they broke the law, so you should do, you should release everything. I, I, I really struggle um, with that argument. I'll let you argue it, but it may not be your best argument here. Well, I understand your concern. All I'm saying is that uh, Metro, wh what they pointed out is they're looking for someone else, not the shooter, that, that's over with. So they're looking for someone else. 
and, and we don't need to discuss these documents at all other than to point out that those three pages do not uh, identify anyone else. And because they do not identify anyone else, they would not be relevant as stated in the Schneider case and, and they should have been produced as uh, a part of a redacted production. So you're saying that this court should, during an open investigation, parlay through certain pages that in the court's mind are not relevant to a contemplated investigation and those should be released in a redacted form. Well, you, you, Your Honor doesn't have to do all the legwork. You need to tell Metro to do that. Now, but at the end of the day, I do the legwork, right? They present what they think should be redacted and then the court goes through and makes the determination of whether or not it, it should be redacted or not. But basically, I put on my investigative hat is what you're suggesting and then I go through and say, yep, release it, not release it, even though they've asserted that the investigation is still open. Uh, well, number one, Chief Hagar apparently has pointed out, as I understand it, they've already produced to you a I redacted have version. Yes, mm -hmm. that's They've true. already produced to you redacted versions. Um, and, yeah, I'm sorry, there's not a whole lot of easy way around this. I, I was thinking this morning about something. I, I, I know your honors and your time on the bench, you've already had a lot of cases, and I hope you're on the bench for many, many years, and you're going to have so many cases. But you know, coming, I, I think it was trial by fire at the beginning. They were like, you know, <laughs> let's just give her all of the things and make sure that she's up for the job. Well, well, when, when the time comes when they, they put your portrait up on the wall here, you will forget so many of the cases you ever had, but I'm going to bet you're going to remember this case. I bet you I will. <laughs> and so it, it is a lot of work for your honor. It's a lot of work for the parties. It's, it's a significant case. And um, <laughs> all I can say is, in the first instance, put the burden on Metro. Uh, and just to finish up on that point, one more aspect of it, you know, another document, really the only other document that I have any insight as to what it is, is the will. Now we've talked about the will before. And, and the explanation for why the will has not been produced is that it mentioned the names of other people, uh, potential witnesses. Well, they can be redacted, block them out. and. If that's the explanation that, uh, well, because other names are mentioned, uh, uh, we can't produce it, once again, go back to those three leaked pages, nobody's name was mentioned. So that whole document should have been produced. And my whole point is, is uh, you know, whatever difficulties you have, try to imagine, you know, our difficult, we don't get to see the documents. I have very little insight as to what those documents are, but I've just given you what little insight I have the three leaked pages and the description of the will, and both of those suggest that there should have been redactions. Yeah, at this point, I want to try to move on to the intervener arguments. Um, for the most part, what the interveners have suggested is a policy argument. Uh, they've suggested that, uh, uh, you know, as your honor pointed out, the whole copycat killer. Uh, all of these policy arguments with the General Assembly, it's very simple. All the General Assembly has to do is say, shooters' writings are not made public, and that's it. Uh, but we don't have anything like that. So from there on out, we, we engage in this uh, activity of saying, well, is it a good thing or a bad thing? That's for the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. I, I want to point out that, uh, as I understand it, they've relied upon the Constitution. That's uh, Article 1, Section 35. That in no way mentions confidentiality of documents. Uh, they also rely upon the Enabling Statute, which is the Victims' Rights Act. That act contains 27 sections and many subsections. And in fact, there are two small subsections that do address confidentiality. But they have got nothing to do with what's being talked about here. Uh, the General Assembly has made it very clear they know how to make certain things confidential, and they have not made those documents confidential. 
Can you speak with me about their supplemental brief in regards to copyright? Yes, Your Honor. And federal law and supremacy clause? Um, well, they've offered no proof that they hold any copyright interest in, in these documents. As I've pointed out in my response, simply because someone writes a document, that does not mean that there is a copyrightable interest. Now, the interveners provided to Your Honor a brief that was filed by the Attorney General in a particular appellate court case, but they didn't really uh, uh, direct Your Honor to that case. That was a case that came out of this courtroom with Judge Lau presiding. Now, that's the case of uh, uh, Public Resource Organization et al. versus Matthew Bender and Company. Um, and, and what our Court of Appeals said is that, um, well, I, I've read so many things, I'm not going to read it. Basically, they said that's for the federal courts to decide if there is a copyright interest. And in fact, you know, they submitted the brief, they didn't submit the case. The people asserting the copyright interest in that case lost. So the copyright interest, uh, that's for the federal courts to decide. So you're saying that the interest that they say that is basically a common law interest, that anything that we write is, there's a, basically a common law um, copyright, uh, for lack of a better term, that that has to be delineated through the copyright office, and until it is, they're not protected, or explain no, your a, argument a little bit more to me. Yeah, no, no, a common law of copyright is no copyright. Uh, Certainly, number one, petitioners do not agree that even if they had a copyright interest, that it would defeat uh, a public records request. But assuming that it did, uh, they have not established that they have a copyright interest in any of these documents. And once again, I had, uh, um, you know, no less than the U.S. Supreme Court's pointed out that simply because there's a writing, that doesn't mean there's a copyright interest in that writing. And also, um, and that's the net effect of that decision that once again came out of this courtroom with Judge Law. Uh, that, that was the decision from the Court of Appeals. Uh, the one document that, uh, once again, is, is the will. I pointed out that wills are not subject to copyright. I mean, there, there's never, as far as I know, there's never been anybody that said, oh, you, you, no one gets to see this will because there's a copyright interest in the will. It is a functional document. Even if ultimately it, it had some deficiencies and it couldn't exercise its function, it was intended to be a functional document, and, and that's not something that there's a copyright interest in. And so uh, all I can say at this time is they haven't established a copyright interest. The burden of proof is on them. It's the, now's the time in the show cause hearing to put up or shut up, and they haven't shown that they got a copyright interest. They've simply said that maybe they do, and maybe doesn't cut it. Uh, and um, with respect to the uh, copyright interest, I'd be happy to try to respond in more questions that the court has, but maybe. Those are more for the interveners. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I did want to, as I pointed out, the this public interest issue of whether uh, it's better to get these records out, or these writings out, or not get the writings out. That's for the General Assembly to decide. But we have submitted hard empirical evidence establishing that there is a historical basis that when these writings and these mass shootings, specifically school mass shootings, are studied, uh, over a 12-year period, there were 67 clear examples of where uh, violence was stopped and prevented. And so that is real. And, it, and, uh, and then uh, they've offered, uh, a as a uh, <coughs> expert witness, uh, a, a Dr. Erica Felix, mm -hmm. who says she's a psychologist. But before they offered that uh, report, this court entered an order on May 26 of 23, stating that the court will not hear live testimony from any expert witness. However, the court will permit the submission of declarations and or affidavits from experts whose affidavits are properly supported therein with the factors as set forth in, you know, the, the uh, 
court decisions of Dalbert and Daniels. And what they submitted from uh, Dr. Felix, it's not an affidavit, it's not a declaration, it's not sworn, and for that reason alone, it needs to be stricken. Uh, and even if this Dr. Felix had provided a sworn statement, uh, it is clear that it does not meet Rule 702 and the requirements for expert testimony. And I'm not going to go through everything, but uh, at one point she says, we already have a wealth of knowledge from the plethora of mass shootings that have happened in the U.S. and globally on the factors that can help reduce the incidence of mass shootings. We do not need a shooter's writings from one incident to make these changes. She does not offer any explanation of how she would have this. This is a law enforcement uh, statement. Uh, it's contrary to that report that, that I provided, the 2021 Secret Service report. Uh, I mean, this is a very basic concept, Your Honor, that no one can deny. We learn from experience. And the more horrible the experience is, the more important it is to learn from that experience and learn everything possible from that experience to prevent future such experiences. And that's what our expert, uh, uh, Ms. Dr. Kuhlman, has pointed out. And with respect to all of the declarations that the interveners have offered in this case, they are all based upon speculation because they've all acknowledged they, they've never seen the documents. They don't know what's in the documents. But the fact that they don't know what's in the documents has not prevented them from speculating on what the documents would cause. They've got the burden to prove, and just speculating on what the documents would cause is not enough. Once again, that's all a public policy issue that's for the General Assembly. So they did not offer any uh, competent evidence about uh, what, the, what the writings of the shooter would cause. Now, once again, we did have those three lead pages, and that was an opportunity for them to come to the court and said, yeah, yeah, these three pages, yeah, this is what we're talking about. This is the harm. But what did they say? They said nothing. They didn't offer any other further declarations after that point. Well, and, you know, Again, I, I won't reiterate the court's position on the disrespect for the rule of law um, that those leaked documents by law enforcement who took the pictures and by the persons who leaked them in contravention of this court's order. You know, so I'm not going to look at the interveners or the respondents, you know, in, in a way that, well, you didn't respond because the persons who chose to not respect the rule of a law, rule of law, I don't know that that deserved a response. So. Okay. Well, but what the intervener said is that they weren't submitting any more declarations because the the proof was closed, and that's not what the court order said. Of course, Metro they submitted another declaration. I submitted a declaration, and then at the end, Metro submits a fifth declaration of. It. So I, I mean, that excuse that they didn't want to do it because the. Uh, evidence was closed. Uh, I think it's closed now. We're here for the show cause hearing, but um, anyway, th th that's the point there. Uh, one final point on one of the declarations they submitted, and that is um, what they called the uh, law enforcement declarations. They offered a declaration of Mark Gwynn, and Mark Gwynn stated in paragraph five of his declaration, just it is second. well known among law enforcement that the writings, such as the writings of the shooter at issue in this case, clearly inspire copycat shootings, end quote. Now, number one, he doesn't say how he knows what such as the writings in this case are. Has he seen what those writings are? I don't think so. Uh, that'd be pretty remarkable if he had. But the important thing is, is you, know, you know, if you had a witness in the witness box there, I don't think you allow them just to say, and I think he's trying to testify as an expert, just to say, well, it's common knowledge. Uh, apparently, it wasn't common knowledge when uh, 
you know, Chief Drake from the Metro Police, early on he said it was going to be released very soon. And Sheriff Darren Hall, he said long ago, and he's never retracted it, that he thought that these things ought to be released. Um, you know, one thing that uh, Dr. Felix did point out is that she was involved in a mass shooting at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and she points out that the writings were released there. So it wasn't common knowledge uh, for the law enforcement there to release the writings. And I pointed out that, you know, we've just passed, I think, the 17th anniversary of the most deadly school shooting in our country. That was at Virginia Tech. The writings were released there. So apparently it was not common knowledge to law enforcement there. I, I mean, for the interveners to offer this sort of evidence, I mean, it's just not worthy. It's not competent. And I don't think Your Honor would allow someone to just take the witness stand and say it's common knowledge. If it's common knowledge, why hasn't the General Assembly done something about it? But I think it's, it's not common knowledge. What it is is what Dr. Kuhlman says. It's a short-term thing, but by studying all of these writings, uh, we can stop some of these shootings. It has happened in the past. And just to finish up, Your Honor, um, Met Metro has not satisfied their burden of proof, uh, specifically with respect to Rule 16, and that's the primary issue with Metro. Uh, Metro did call us to task because we didn't address one of their arguments about Calstrom and deja vu. Uh, number one, we didn't address it because that's not one of the five exemptions that they raised. Those are clearly separate, completely apart from their mm -hmm. exemptions. Uh, but uh, I'm going to let my co-petitioners try to respond to your question about something about school security. But my client did not request it, and we're simply re requesting that the court apply the general rule, which is that the, the Public Records Act should be interpreted to allow the fullest possible access. And for that reason, it should not be interpreted narrowly, which is what the interveners said. The interveners said that school security uh, exception should be applied broadly. They cited no authority for that proposition, and quite frankly, uh, the authority is to the contrary. So uh, that's the way that should be interpreted. Uh, all of this business about a copycat killer or whether we're going to save lives, I, I think I got the better argument there. I got hard empirical evidence that shows that I do, but in any event, that's a public policy decision for the General Assembly. With respect to the copyright issue, they've not established the copyright, and that's for the federal courts to decide. Thank you, Ron. One question I do have for you. So since the toxicology reports and the autopsy reports have already been released, it is, is it your position that that is moot, or are you still looking for Metro to release that information? Uh, once again, that was not a part of my request, okay. and I think I should defer to one of my co-petitioners. Okay. Thank you. I have it under you, so thank you. All right. All right. Next petitioner. Mr. Hammond. Your Honor. I think we should try put this case into focus. Okay, I'm going to need you to take the, the well, podium. I, oh. I don't project well enough. Well, I just, yeah. yeah, thank you. So when speaking, if you will, we take the podium. Your Honor, I think we should, or at least in my opinion, we should attempt to put this matter into proper perspective. And in doing that, perhaps we can resolve some of your honor's concerns, uh, and maybe we can uh, focus this thing so that we have a more easily ascertainable path toward resolving the issues that confront us. First, this is a Public Records Act case, pure and simple. That's all it is. This is a Public Records Act case. A group of petitioners said to the custodian of the records, please provide the following records because they are public. 
the custodian said to the, to, the, to the petitioners, the person seeking the information, the requestors, no, we're not going to provide those records. And then they proceeded to use a, a, some explanations for why they would not provide the records. So therefore, you know, are, do we start from this position? Number one, the records are public. If made or received pursuant to the government's responsibility, 107503A1A, are these public records just looked at in a very clear, concise, and totally, totally segregated point of view? Are they public records? The answer is yes, they are. If they're public records, and then we look at the Public Records Act, what does it say? If it is a public record, and it is not exempt from disclosure pursuant to law, then it has to be made public. Which gets us to the second phase. Phase one, is it a public record? If yes, go to phase two. So yes, now we go to phase two. And so the, the, the records custodians have said, we don't have to produce these records because there are reasons which justify non-disclosure. If we, and, and I, we have to, I think, further delineate between the metro position and the position of the intervenors, which I would like to get into separate from that. Okay, so you're going to address metro first and I'm then- metro first. Okay, thank you. So when we look at metro, then we get to that, those four big decisions that Mr. Pierce just outlined. Holt, Schneider, uh, Holt, Atman, Schneider, and what I call the Vandy case. It's the, the Metro, uh, Tennessean versus the Metro government, uh, the, the style of it, but it, it is the Vandy case. I call it the Vandy rape case. You look at those four cases. Now, Your Honor also has a question about the Griffin case. So you have Holt, Atman, Griffin, and then you have uh, Schneider, and then you have Vanderbilt. Well, and the court, in, in all honesty, thinks that Griffin is more on point with this case simply because of the facts and the materials, so. Okay, now, now may I then, Your Honor? You may. How, how does Your Honor see the Griffin case as being more on, all, on point with the issues in this case than some of the other cases? Are you asking the court? I'm just asking you to help clarify so that I can try to make an intelligent response. Of course. So in the Griffin case, we have a suicide. We have notes um, by, I believe it was representative. Ted Ray Miller. Yes. So we, we have a representative who apparently may have been being investigated for for some type of corruption. You're we correct, have a, he was. We have a suicide, and then we have what happens with those notes, whether yes. or not those notes um, go back to the wife, come out for public consumption, and therein, the court finds that the facts of that case are analogous to the facts of this case, and the court focuses specifically on the open investigation versus the closed investigation, which this court finds that the Griffin case, if we're going to look at facts, you know, which cases are similar, I think that Apperman, um, Memphis, Schneider, those are just factually different. So I'm looking at an apples to apples comparison when I look at Griffin because we have a decedent. Uh, we have a suicide, we have whether or not those notes come out. Now, at the end of the day, the notes did come out, but after the investigation was over. And the, the court still, um, when I look at the rule, when I look at whether or not we're investigating, we're not investigating, you know, the court believes that that is the key to this case. So if you want to answer I can, that I can give you the backstory on the Ted Ray Miller case. Well, I don't know that the backstory, you know. <laughs> Ted, but it does. It plays into all of this, Your sure. Honor. Okay. Ted Ray Miller was, a, was the brother of Ace Miller. 
Ace Miller was the absolute patron, the father of, the, of, of Golden Gloves boxing in Knox County. His, his boxers were, were tremendous. He did wonderful service for the community through the Fraternal Order of Police and, and, and the use of the Golden Gloves to help rehabilitate troubled children. One of his protégés, by the way, was briefly the heavyweight champion of the world, Big John Tate. One, one fight, but he was heavyweight champion for a while, and that was Ace Miller's protege. So Ace Miller was the brother of Ted Ray Miller. Ted Ray Miller is a, is, was a representative, or he was a member of the legislature. I can't remember if he was a representative or a senator. But it was alleged that he was involved in kickbacks or taking money for favors, whatever. So a young Knoxville lawyer named Richard Beeler was wired by the FBI and was sent to see Mr. Miller and to attempt to negotiate a deal, which allegedly he did. When the information became public that Mr. Miller was a person of interest and it was in regard to this tape that had been taken from the interview with him and the lawyer who later became Knox County Law Director, he took his own life. When he took his own life, his family was not present. He swallowed a 12-gauge shotgun. That's always the way they, you know, you make a statement when you do that. And so when his family got home, here he was, and there was a suicide note. Police came and investigated. As part of their investigation to determine what this was all about, was pretty obvious, but they had to investigate. They took the suicide note, took it into their possession, and made a copy of it. Subsequently, Miller's wife asked for the note to be returned to her. Griffin said, wait a minute, the copy belongs to the people because the copy is a public record. And so that's, that's how that was decided. That's how that case was decided. The, the, the original note went back to the widow, the copy remained in police custody, the copy that was in police custody was then released to the public under the Public Records Act. And, and the reason for that, there, you're right, Your Honor, there was no ongoing investigation because there was no contemplated or criminal prosecution because Ted Ray Miller had obviously killed himself. And he killed himself to get out from under this FBI investigation, which was going to uh, cause him some real grief. So yes, that's what Ted Ray Miller case stands for, but it, again, its facts are, you know, I, I see a similarity, but I don't see an exact similarity between our cases. Now, as, as you know, Holt involved the, uh, a shootout, uh, and, and the deceased, uh, perpetrator died as a result of police gunfire. There was no further investigation there. Everybody admitted that the, that the perpetrator was dead. There was no criminal act, no criminal action being contemplated or being actually pursued. You take Schneider, well, Atman, Atman. John Atman and Herb Monsier were representing two individuals. Uh, I think Herb's client was a man named Shuffle Street, who were, they were accused of killing and or being an accomplice after the fact to the killing of an inmate in the Brushing Mountain Regional Facility. They were all there, they were all uh, prisoners. So Atman and Monsier decided that they would make an end run on the Tennessee rules of criminal procedure. And instead of asking for the information that they were entitled to receive under Rule 16, they would simply go to the court and ask for a Public Records Act request, which would then compel uh, Worthington, who was a sergeant who was in charge of the investigation, to give all of his information to them under the Public Records Act. Everything, with regard, without regard to any limitations based on Rule 16. Trial court said, they can't do that. Court of Appeals said, yes, you can. Supreme Court said, no, you can't. And that's where the Rule 16 exception 
was first really articulated was in Atman versus Worthington. And there, and, and as a result, Your Honor, not only was that Rule 16 rule articulated, but the legislature came in and in December of 1987, I believe, uh, there was a statute passed exempting the investigative files of the Department of Correction from public disclosure. So, it, they, so not only was Rule 16 first articulated as a basis for a test, but the legislature stepped in and said, you aren't going to do this anymore. All the records of the Department of Correction, uh, investigative records, are going to be confidential under 107505. I mean 504, I'm sorry, 504. And that's, by, that's happened. Then in Schneider, you had a situation where field interview notes were taken by officers who were in random, apparently, stopping somebody and saying, what's your name, your social security number, your date of birth, how tall are you, what do you weigh, let's see you're driving this kind of car, what's the license number, and they would make notes, and those notes would then be kept. The ostensible purpose for this was an attempt to crack, to crack down on gang violence. Now, it, it, it's uncertain, it's unclear from the record in uh, uh, Schneider how many of those field interview notes, cards, actually became part of criminal uh, investigation into criminal conduct. And so when the, when the request was made for the field review notes, then the Supreme Court said well, that the Supreme Court didn't abrogate Atlin. The Supreme Court didn't step away from the Rule 16. It just said it doesn't apply here because there's no proof that these interview notes, these cards, pertain to actual or contemplated criminal prosecution. Well, and that's where I, I appreciate you um, telling the court um, about the cases that are instructive, but this case is different. Would you agree? So in Memphis Publishing, November 1984, the Commercial Appeal sought to inspect the closed investigative Correct. file. Correct. Right? Correct. In Atman, closed investigative no. file. Not at all. Pardon me, Your Honor, no. Okay. Atman was an ongoing investigation. Remember, Shuffle Street was a, was a, a party of an, a, 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 an accessory after the fact. They were investigating the killing of a prisoner by other prisoners in the Brushy Mountain facility, the regional, regional correctional facility. So that was very much an ongoing criminal procedure. It was not closed in any way at all. Okay. And so that, that's what they attempted to do. They attempted to do an end run on Rule 16 disclosure requirements by saying, well, wait, we'll go to the, to the court and we'll get the entire file because we can get that through the Public Records Act, and that's what led to Atman, and that's what led to the application by the Supreme Court of Rule 16 as having the force of law and therefore being an exception to the Public Records Act where it says, except as otherwise provided by law. Now, at that time, in the Atman situation, there was a little window of time where instead of saying otherwise provided by law, it said as otherwise provided by state statute. And that was what, as you'll see noted in the Atman decision, they talk about the words otherwise noted by state statute, but that didn't matter because Rule 16, the rules promulgated by the court, ratified by the legislature, signed by the governor, had in the court's opinion the force of law. So whether it was by statute or whether it was some other provision of the law, it didn't matter because these rules have the force of law. And That's Rule 16, having the force of law, correct. has an exception when there is an open investigation. Correct. Okay, so in this case, Metro, you know, and I haven't spoken with them about what um, the status of the investigation is, but based on reading their papers, they continue to say that the investigation yes. is open, that they're wrapping up. So pursuant to Rule 16, if there is an open investigation and something contemplated, or open investigation or 
contemplated, then there is no disclosure. So the petitioners, you know, I, I spoke at, um, I spoke with Mr. Pierce a lot about this open investigation piece. Is it, is it your position that this court also should step into the shoes and determine whether or not Metro, frankly, is being truthful and upright in their affidavits as to whether or not there is an open investigation or the investigation is closed. Now, I would never ask the court to become a Jessica Fletcher or a, a Miss Markle. I would never ask that. I don't think that's the proper proper test. What we have to look at, may it please the court, is the test and in its narrow form. Because what does, what does Rule 16 and the application of Rule 16, according to the courts, what have they said it does? It's, it creates an exemption, as otherwise provided by law, to the Open Records Act as long as one of two criteria can be met. One, it has to be a, an ongoing investigation into two, either a contemplated or an active criminal case. So you, you've got to, you, yes, it, it's an ongoing investigation and it's into an active or, or, or contemplated criminal case. But again, let's go back to the burden of proof. Because this is an Open Records Act case, the burden of proof lies with Metro. We've said to Metro, give us these records. Metro said, no, we don't have to give you the records and here are the reasons. Fine, the act says they have to approve that by a preponderance of the evidence. And now, so what- and they, if, if, it had, if it had been the way we wanted it, they would have had to approve it by clear and convincing evidence, like in the Reporter Shield case. But we couldn't get that through the legislature. But we got the, the, the preponderance of the evidence. Now, there, there is the, the situation which puts the court in, in sort of in the vortex. And your honors, well, I see the smile. It, it does put the court in the vortex because now Metro has come in and said, we have an active ongoing investigation into contemplated criminal proceedings. And then the court has to say, well, have you carried your burden of proof by a preponderance of the evidence. And as we know about preponderance of the evidence, it's not the preponderance of the witnesses, but the preponderance of the, of the, the actual evidence that can be the, the, the corroborative substantial evidence that, that matters, in other words, not just a, a speculation. So what I think the, the problem there, and your honor is absolutely right, we're dealing with the, with the issue of an ongoing, allegedly ongoing investigation into what? Either actual or contemplated criminal prosecution. Now we know it's not actual criminal prosecution because the shooter has deceased. And therefore, and, and as Metro points out, in the, def, in the declaration of Lieutenant Gibson, um, under the Uniform Crime Reporting Program, you gotta clear it by arrest. However, in, so in, in, in an exceptional case, where the, identif where the offender's dead, or for some reason can't be uh, brought into the, cup of the, uh, uh, the jurisdiction of the court, then you can ask that it be cleared exceptionally. But now, the, uh, Metro is, uh, uh, let's look at, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Pa paragraph 10 of the Gibson's declaration. Give me one second, let me pull it up. Did you bring a, a copy for, to put on the Elmo? If you didn't, it's fine. But if you did. I didn't, Your Honor. Okay, no I've worries. There's a limit to how many pounds of paper I can carry. I understand, I understand. And we're looking for Gibson, is that right? Yes, uh -huh. it's Gibson's fifth declaration. 
uh, filed on the 25th of March, 2024. All right, I have it. Does anyone have a copy that they would like to put on the Elmo? If not, it's fine. 